This, this session is going to be about the journey of a 16-year-old gay teenager in London in, at the start of the 1980s. It was the first challenge to the law in the UK which set the gay male age of consent at 21 because before that, because the heterosexual age was 16. And I'd, I'm Lisa Power, uh, I'm one of the organisers of this event, and I'd like to introduce to you Richard Desmond, who was that 16-year-old boy. Um, you can work out for yourself what that means in age terms. He's not shy. Richard has been a gay activist all his life, but today we're going to mainly talk about the journey to Strasbourg in the 80s uh, and how that came about. So, Richard, tell us what was going on for you um, as a 16-year-old gay lad in London. I'd come out at 15. Um, I, was, I was going along to the gay teenage group. I had friends. Um, we were very fortunate. London had the first ever gay youth group. Um, it was called the London Gay Teenage Group, and it was in Holloway in North London. And it seemed like an awful long way from Mile End to Holloway. It's not really very far. But as a teenager, it seemed like an enormous distance. And I went there. And that was the, that was the start of, of how I think. In my it notes that actually went to, to the court, it's, it says here, at, 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 went to Roman Catholic School between the ages of 12 and 14. He, he engaged in mutual masturbation with boys of his own age. So that was, that was the start of my sex life, and it, and it was detailed for the benefit of the European Court of Human Rights by a brilliant barrister called Peter Ashman. Well, we'll get on to that, but tell us a little bit about your home life, because it's unusual for someone at that time to come out at that age. Um, what was your family life like? Um, I had a very, I still do have a very peculiar family, but I think every family is peculiar. Um, my mother had brain surgery in 1966, which meant she was left with... A very unusual condition that's difficult to explain. Brain injury is always different to anyone who experiences it. And basically, it left my dear mum very suggestible. She does as she's told, particularly by me. Um, and for some reason, as far as my mother's concerned, I can do no wrong. Which is a great advantage, particularly when you want to do things like sign court papers. Um, my, my late father worked for a brewery and liked to drink, um, is the polite way of putting it. Um, so he wasn't around very much. I had a grandmother who worked for Norman Hartnell, who made frocks for the Queen um, in, the, in the 40s and 50s. She knew I was gay before I did. She was a wonderful old girl and incredi incredibly supportive and made my life an awful lot easier because my nan did what I wanted to. And she was the main influence in my life. She, lar she largely brought me up. Um, and it was an East End family. Um, the East End of London has a long tradition in, in kind of strong matriarchs. And my childhood was influenced by my nan and her sisters, who were classic East End old ladies. And how did you find it? Because it was difficult. We had no internet or anything then. How did you find out about the London Gay Teenage Group? Well, on, the, on, on Capital Radio in London, there, there was a show called Anna and the Dock. And Anna Rayburn played the gay switchboard jingle. Uh -huh. Now, the phone numbers changed. But if you Google Switchable Jingle, you can still hear it. It was by Tom Robinson. And it was a very easy way of remembering, uh, remembering 8377324, because you didn't need the 01 bit in those days. Um, and I phoned. And strange it may seem, the first time I phoned, I was too scared to talk, which is difficult for anyone to believe. Now I'd ever shut up. Um, but, but the first time I phoned, I was too scared to talk. And, you know, phones used to be a strange thing. They were on the stairs. You had to make an effort to go and make a phone call. And I phoned Switchboard, and eventually they told me about Parents' Inquiry, and I went to Rose Roberts and then the teenage group. But everything started through Switchboard. Which you later joined. I later joined, and you and I have history with. <laughs> um, but you're still with them now, aren't I you? I am still a Switchboard volunteer. I'm one of the longest standing volunteers. Um, I've had lots of roles in the organisation over the years, and I'm still very proud of what, of what we do. Um, we are there and have been there for people all over the UK, but, but my journey started by phoning switchboard. And then you went to the London Gay Teenage Group. I went to the London Gay Teenage Group. And what was it like? Originally, it was, it, it, it was a bit hostile and a bit cliquey. 
Um, but I, I persevered and I went back and I became part of the clique. Um, it was organised by teenagers, which was a, a kind of unique thing. Because had adults been involved, then they might have been drawn into criminal activity, i.e. teenagers having sex. What a shocking thought, somebody who's 16 might have sex. Um, consequently, London Gay Teenage Group, LGTG, was self-organised, which was a remarkable thing, you know, to have, to have a, a, a group of 16 to 21 year olds. I say 16, the, the teenage group had a question they asked when you went along, which was, you are 16, aren't you? <laughs> um, there might have been one or two people who weren't quite 16 um, who got along but it was really scary because we could have been prosecuted the, the law was real 21 was the age of consent now the police were outside taking pictures of us and we had the news of the world do an expose and we had the, the, the Daily Mail make a fuss we took pictures or they thought we took pictures of them taking pictures of us the truth is we couldn't actually afford the film for the camera. Um, so, so we had a camera, we pretended to take pictures. You pointed and clicked. We pointed and clicked. <laughs> but, but, but we couldn't actually afford to buy the film. So, so there, weren't, there, weren't, there weren't actually any real pictures of people taking pictures of us. But we pretended to. Um, Manor Gardens in Holloway is, is this little narrow street off Holloway Road. So it, where the people were in the cars taking pictures was really obvious. Because there was nothing else in the road. If you were there on a Sunday afternoon, there was only the teenage group. There was nothing else in that road. So it was really obvious that these people were spying on us. Um, it's difficult to think now that it was that controversial. You know, now every big town in the UK has got a gay youth group. And it's a wonderful thing. 40 years ago, there was one. And it was legally really dodgy. But eventually you got a grant, didn't you? We got, we, there was a thing called Inner London, Inner London Educational Authority, ILEA, and we got the first grant and it paid for our first youth worker and we became an official ILEA youth group, um, which meant the youth workers were theoretically in charge. And it's called the gay group, but in those days, gay covered both women and men sometimes. We had so. the young lesbian group as well. Um, the, young lesbian, the young lesbian group met separately and came together for, for parties. Teenage group parties were a thing. Um, and and the, young, the young lesbian group organised separately. In part because when you've got a group that's mixed, men tend to swamp things. And as one of my friends said at the time, it was just more fun for the women. So it was about fun and they had it, as, as, did, as did we. But the parties could get quite lively, couldn't they? Well, the teenage group party in late 1979... Um, we had booze. Now, bear in mind, the upper age of the group was 21, but most of us were 16 or 17. Um, I don't think that the, the owners of Manor Garden Centre would have been entirely approving that the amount of alcohol that was in the little office at the back. But there was a little office at the back, and I got between the lesbians and the alcohol, and I got a black eye. <laughs> now, my mum thought I was at the church youth group. <laughs> my mum thought I was at St Mary and St Erkenwald's youth group. Um, consequently, I had to tell the truth. So I was out at 15 um, because I got a black eye off a lesbian because I was between her and the booze. Um, it, it was in many ways a blessing because if you come out at 15, you're never really in. And so I, 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 was, I, was, out, I was out at 15 and my, my world changed, but it changed for the better. So... How did you come to be the person who became anonymous versus the UK government? The teenage group, as I said, big part of my life, Sunday afternoons, Holloway Road. Um, Peter Ashman, the barrister, and Nigel Warner, who was sort of bobbing to Peter's Batman. I can't think of another way of putting it. <laughs> um, and they were from? They were from CHE's Law Reform Committee. Um, CHE? Campaign for Homosexual Equality. For the young ones in the audience. At the time, CHE had a whole load of groups around the country that were kind of support and social groups. And they had a group based in London that did the politics. And Peter and Nigel were the Law Reform Committee. And they came along and they were looking for somebody who was 16. And it was important that they were 16 because 16 was equality. Um, and I was there. 
At the time, I had an uncle in prison in South Africa, and in the way that only a 16-year-old could really think about it, I, I, I saw the age of consent and the discrimination we were getting uh, as being something like the discrimination that was happening politically elsewhere in the world. I was completely wrong. It's a completely stupid comparison. But when you're 16, things are a bit different. So I was political anyway, and I come from a political family. Um, and Nigel was asking if anyone could do this or anyone could get a parent to sign it. I knew that my mum would do anything for me. So I said, yes, I could get my mum to sign the papers. And in the upstairs bar with the Edward VI, after a few Chinzanos and lemonades, um, she signed the papers. And that's what made it possible. And it's 40 years ago this year. So how did you feel about doing that? I mean, you, you felt you were striking a blow? I, I felt it was really important because then, as now, I felt equality was important. Um, there, were, there were other opportunities. There were other things that were, that were going on. We did marches. We, we, we made a fuss. But none of them seemed to have a real chance of making any significant progress. Um, we talked, the age of consent wasn't an issue for the majority population. You know, now we have come so far in such a short period of time, the idea of not having equality seems odd. But then people really were being prosecuted just for being in love when they were 16, 17. And it wasn't just the old, I think there's a, an assumption that prosecutions happen to the older partner who might be over 21, but in fact, Anybody who was over 16 was prosecuted as well. Yeah, and, and in doing the case, um, and I, this is the paperwork, which the, the applicant's psychosexual development is what it, what it says. I was admitting being a criminal. I was admitting to, to the European court that I had sex, and, and I was a criminal. And consequently, um, and there was some protection offered because it was going to the court. But consequently, there were certainly police inquiries, and I was certainly watched by the police. And you had to be anonymous, didn't you? Uh, Peter said I was anonymous because it was risking notoriety. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I, it, was one, it was one of those things. I, I was, I've always been, you know, since 15, I've been out. It wasn't an issue for me. But Peter was a, ve was a very wise man, and I took his advice. So the case in its initial hearing was anonymous. And did Peter warn you about what might happen? Peter warned me of notoriety. Peter, Peter warned me that, that if it did get to the court, then it was likely to be all over the papers. Um, for various reasons, it didn't get to the court. Tell us about that. Um, at that point, there was a commission stage where representatives of all the signatories to the European, the European Convention on Human Rights were a commission. Um, and it went to the Commission, and the Commission made a, a ruling um, which was in line with the, with the Dudgeon case, which was preceded it, that countries were allowed to make their own rules, um, and, cons and consequently, the case failed. Um, it proved it was possible to take a case, and the Commission was abolished later, so subsequent applicants went straight to the court and eventually succeeded. But my case proved that it was possible to take a case. It was the first one. And how did, how did the people around you react? Did people know that you were taking that case? It, because we did the papers and they were filed and it was two years later that the, the decision came, um, apart from my late partner, it wasn't really something, you know, you, you, know, you kind of get on with your life. Um, it won't shock anyone to know I was working in a sleazy leather bar. Um, and, 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 the news, came through, the news came through, it was called The Cellar. It was the best, best bar London's ever had, but that's another story. Um, I was working in The Cellar Bar, and Peter Ashman phoned up one, one Friday evening and told my late partner it had failed. And Bob came in and said, you know, sorry, love, it hadn't worked. Um, it wasn't hugely publicised. Um, had we succeeded, it might have been. But it was, a very, it was a, almost a prosaic thing. We, we, the work was done, um, and as I said, as far as I'm concerned, um, I would like, I'd like a statue in, in Parliament Square in London to Peter Ashman, in the way we have a statue here to, to, to Ivan Novello, you know, both great gay men who changed the world in their own ways. Um, Peter Ashman was, was just a huge hero. 
And his papers are about to be collected, aren't they? His um, papers are about to be all, archived. All, all his papers are going into the Bishopsgate archive. Um, my copies of the papers were on 1980s photocopier paper that had curled and gone grey. Um, I got this from Nigel Warner last week, um, which is on, on modern paper, so it's, so, it, so it's actually a clearer copy. And it's, it's quite humorous looking back on it and what I, what I had said. So what did you go on to do? This happened and it didn't work. Um, I, I, did I, then I, I, I went on and, and had my career as a theatre electrician in, in, in the West End in London um, and volunteering with Switchboard and, and Positive the UK and various other things. I, my, my, act, my activism um, has, has spread. I, do, I don't just do LGBT things these days. I do things with parks. I, one of those things, people who are activists tend to, to get involved and do things, and it's been, it's been good for me. But it all started with the Strasbourg case. It all started. The first thing I did was the Strasbourg case and the teenage group. And if people want to know more about the Strasbourg case, it's written up, isn't it? It's in a book. It's in a book called Going to Strasbourg. And you, you can remember the author's name. I probably can't. I can't, actually. It's Paul Johnson. Oh, there you go. It's Prof Professor Paul Johnson. Um, and it, ha it has interviews with, with all, the all the Strasbourg applicants. Because, um, because yours was the first, but it was far from the last. Yeah. And people remember the other ones because the men who took them, the, the teenagers who took them, and Stonewall, who managed the case, did a lot of publicity around them. So there was a case of... And they did it in stages, didn't they? Because yours was... A really, you know, a blunt instrument. You were 16. You were, you were the right at the bottom edge. So it was the biggest challenge possible. And when Stonewall took their first case, they chose gay men who were over 18, but under 21, so that it was a much less. And we had that case. brief incremental stage where the age of consent was 18. That's what happened in Parliament as a as a sort of result of the the case being won at the European Court. I, that time. I don't think. Certainly in, in the 80s, um, CHE have the same kind of... It's not, it's not that the CHE Law Reform Committee and, and the people involved with CHE w weren't aware. It was just a different dynamic. They weren't aware of the politics in quite the same way. Where, Stone, where Stonewall came along, there was a very definite political knowledge mm. and politicians and, and, and people aware of politics were involved. And they hijacked Peter Ashman. And they hijacked Peter I, Ashman. I should say we hijacked Peter Ashman. I was one of them. Um, There's a lawyer we need. Go and get him. And <laughs> you know, at that time, he was director of the European Human Rights Foundation. You know, he 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 was in the in the non-LGBT world still a very significant figure. Uh, he did a lot of good work in, in in all sorts of legal cases that were the, the cases that were difficult and and, and and hard law is what Peter did in the real world. Um, and the LGBT stuff um, was his, his side job almost. But he did it for Stonewall. And we just didn't have the kind of publicity machine that Stonewall has now. And I don't think... The media was different in the 80s. Mm. You know, you would, I, I imagine... I didn't get involved in doing it at all, but, but I imagine it was a world of press releases, not tweets. That's right. Yeah. You know, you know it, 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 was, it was a very different dynamic. Um, but we did it, and it was worth doing, and it proved that the case could be taken. And that was the, that was the important thing, because it then, because that precedent had been set, it gave the, other oppo the others opportunity. So you opened a door, essentially. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm still very proud of it. Yeah. And if people want to read about um, the, the going to Strasbourg, not just your case, but also all the other ones that were to do with LGBT rights, including uh, a Welsh uh, person called Wena Parry, who is a trans preacher. Uh, I don't know if her... I think her... Um, yes, she is. She's up on the exhibition, Icons and Allies, upstairs. She is also in that book. Um, she was the first person to take a trans case uh, to the European Court of Human Rights, because in those days, you... Had in order to legally transition, if you were married, you had to divorce your partner. And Wena, being a deeply religious evangelical uh, preacher, proper chapel, um, but also trance, said, whom God hath brought together, let no man put asunder. I'm not divorcing my wife for your earthly laws. 
um, which caused absolute havoc. Uh, and again, she didn't win, but it opened the doors for other cases to be brought later on. I, I think in, in the book there is, there, there is this clear um, way that these cases happen. Mm. There, there are early cases that go to the, go to the court and fail. Yeah. Then there are subsequent cases that, get, that go to the court and make progress. And, and that's it, that seems to be a pattern with the you know, human rights cases, not just LGBT ones, but that seems to be the pattern that happens. You have to establish a boundary and then push it. Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 that, that's how it would appear to go. But if you, want, if you want to read that book, I strongly advise you get it from a library because it's a horrific amount of money, like most academic books. So do order it from your local library. It is certainly, yeah. it is certainly, it is certainly in the, it's certainly in the libraries. And so you went back to the teenage group and carried on with the teenage group, presumably. I carried, I carried on with, I carried on with the teenage group. Um, I said it, it was a unique group in that it was organised by teenagers for teenagers. We had a committee of the great and the good, who were supposed to be supervising us. Um, it was the formative space in my life. I, I, I met my late partner there. Um, I fell in love as only teenagers can. And, and we were together for nine, for nine years and nine months. Um, it was just a remarkable space. I left before I was 21 because I, I was working. And you had to leave when you were 21. So I got, I got out before I was 21. I left when I was about 19 or 20. But it, it, was, it was a really important thing, and I was very proud to be involved with that. I seem to remember from the switchboard end of things that the teenage group was very important in spreading our phone number through guerrilla means. Is uh, that right? That is in, in, entirely true. I, I and lots of other teenage group people, um, if, if people have seen the movie Pride. They've actually got the switchboard phone number wrong on it. Um, really irritating. Which was really irritating, but they couldn't put the new 0300 phone number anyway. Um, the, the, we wrote the switchable phone number anywhere we could. We graffitied it everywhere. Um, school lavatories all over London, um, on, on walls whenever, whenever we could. Um, there were switchable stickers as well, which the switchable stickers had a, had a thing on them, not to, not, to be stuck, not to be stuck on public places or something. Yeah. It, was, it was in tiny print on the bottom of the sticker. <laughs> so it's, you know, they were all over the London underground, enti entirely where they weren't supposed to be. Um, because so many people were sent to the teenage group from Switchboard. Switchboard and the teenage group had a really close relationship. Um, a, a brilliant man called Jonathan Waters was, was from Switchboard on our committee and was my first personal trainer at Switchboard when I joined. Um, it was just part of how things were at the time, getting that number out there. And so there was, there was that relationship between LGTG and Switchboard mm. and the young lesbian group and Switchboard. Because the phone, switchboard's phone number didn't, it, there, were, there was no internet, and even the yellow pages, which was what you had as the directory for the phone, would not carry switchboard's number until the mid 80s. We had a real fight to get it in there, didn't we? It, it became in the front of every phone book in the country. Um, eventually. Yeah. Eventually, but, but at, the, at that point in, in, in the early 80s, you had to look it up under GA in the phone book it wasn't listed anywhere special yes. but under g in the phone book there was a switchboard and 8377324 so looking back on that are you pleased that you took that case oh i'm hugely proud of it and it, it it's it's part of, it's part of my history and i'm really i'm really glad to have done it and you know with the benefit of 40 years hindsight um i can see how important it was reading the, reading the notes that, that peter took and I had this conversation in Nigel Warner's posh house. Now, I, I was a very ordinary working class kid. And going to uh, Nigel's very posh house with sort of real antique furniture and bound house chairs, and it was sort of terribly nice, in, his, in Islington, and talking about my sex life, um, which produced these notes. Um, it, just seemed, it, still, it still seems like a very odd thing to have done. <laughs> But, the, I, but it had to be me saying this is the sex I had and I was a criminal because that was the basis of going to the court. It had to be the fact that I could have been prosecuted that, that, was, that was the basis for going to Strasbourg. We didn't get to go to Strasbourg. I, 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 
I rather like the sound of it. They did vocal oysters, apparently. Um, but we didn't actually get to go. But we, but we did get to go on paper. And it was, it was this basis that 16-year-olds are entitled to have the same fun as their peers. The idea that, that, that I could have a relationship with a young woman, but, but the, relationships I was ha the relationships I were having with men at the time could have put us both in prison. And it was prison. This wasn't a, 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 a abstract thing. This, people were going to prison at the time for have, you know, young offenders institutions for being 16, falling in love and having sex. It was, it was, they were being locked up. And it could have been me, but thankfully it wasn't. So you opened the door for gay teenagers, and it took a while, but the door got kicked further open. We, we did eventually succeed. And now it's equality. And now it's equality. And the interesting thing now is the, num the number of young people who are regarding their equality as being something that is just right. You don't, you don't the idea that it, it's something that had to be fought for has perhaps slipped away, but perhaps that's right as well. You know, we, we've, got, we've got the right ruling. It, we, have, we have justice and fairness. I hate the idea that future generations after ours ought to be somehow grateful to us, because we didn't do it for people to be grateful to us. We did it so that people could have more fun. And, and because it was, the, it was the right thing to do. And I must admit, of all the people involved in this, um, my old mum, um, I am particularly grateful to. Obviously, she's my mum, so, so uh, there is a bit, a, a bit of bias there. But, 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 the, but the old duck did sign the papers, and, and it couldn't have been done without her. Well, I think we're probably all very grateful to your mum, <laughs> and we're very grateful to you, and thank you, Richard. Thank you. We've got section, um, which, are not, which you can't do now, because they've changed canon law. So you can't actually leave the Catholic Church very easily anymore, but I did um, before they changed the rules. Um, I, beca I became rather militantly anti-religious. One of my friends and colleagues at, at Switchboard was a man called Mark Ashton, who, who was Welsh. And if you, if you saw the film... Oh, he was Irish. He was Irish, yeah. sorry. I, I'm no, wrong. Welsh miners. Yes, he was Welsh miners. Yeah. But anyway, yes, LGBT support, support, support the miners. Anyway, Mark Ashton um, did a wonderful bit of, of, of decoration on, on the Switchboard religion file, turning it into the big book, book of myths and fables. Um, with decoupage and pearls. It was, it was a, a joy to behold. You know, you know religion is, is, one, is one of those things that I have steered, steered away from. But in terms of our rights, there, are, there, is, there has been a consistent opposition from established religion stopping, stopping LGBT rights. And I'm sure when it got to the vote, the, the religious campaign against us would, would have been stronger, but we didn't, we didn't quite get that far when I was involved. Yep. The bishops consistently voted against gay rights in the Lords, for example. Yeah. yeah. But there you go. You know, we, don't, we don't have a Bible Belt in quite the same way in this country, is, 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 is the bottom line. And I think we should say, certainly here in Cardiff, we have an extremely strong, supportive um, group of Christian people in the, called The Gathering. Yeah? Um, and they're always very supportive of LGBT events now. But it, certainly when, when you were taking this case, there weren't many church people speaking out. There, there was LGCM, there's been a gay Christian movement, as was. Now, now they've changed their name, which I can't remember what it is. One, it, body, it, one, one body, one faith now. But, they, but they, they, they were in a church tower in Allgate in London with, with my friend Richard Kirker. Um, so you know, time has changed and it's a much bigger movement than it was then. Yes. Cheryl. Uh, Richard, you spoke about how the equalising of the age of consent was forced on the government by the European courts. The same was true of the Gender Recognition Act. And Jonathan Cooper has written very eloquently about how the vast majority of, of our uh, equality rights were in fact a product of European courts. And the current government has talked endlessly about how they wish to have the country freed of European legislation and get rid of oppressive laws imposed upon us from outside. So what do, do both of you think the, the future holds once we are no longer beholden to European laws? There's a bit of a misnomer there in terms of the difference between the European, the European community and the European Convention on Human Rights. 
They're completely different and separate things. Um, it would require an act of parliament separate from the current ones for us to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, I think that there would be considerable opposition to us leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. The European Convention on Human Rights is far broader than the, Europe than the European community. There are far more signatories. Um, it's, a, it's a different thing. It's not part of the EU. You ha if you're a member of the EU, you have to be a member of the, Europe of the European Convention on Human Rights, or si a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. But you don't have to be a member of the EU to be a, to be a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights. So you can, be, you can be in the Convention on Human Rights and outside the EU, and that's the position we'll find ourselves in now. Although I have to say, I wouldn't put it past them to try and take us out of the European Convention on Human Rights, because they seem pretty determined to wreck anything to do with Europe. My nightmare for the future is chlorinated chicken and homophobia. <laughs> I hope we have neither of them. Any other questions from the audience? At the back, Abdu. Um, that's a, that was a brilliant talk, by the way. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Um, there is um, still se more than 70 countries uh, around the world that are still criminalizing the LGBT community. What is your advice for the activists who are still in the countries fighting to change the laws and change the perspective in fighting the homophobia? I'm in a little bit of an unusual position with this in that I answer email for Switchboard. Um, so we get emails from people in the Arab world, in Africa, in, 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 in India, in, in Pakistan and, and Bangladesh, um, who are living in countries that are on the most basic way detrimental to their health and, less, and, 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 and their mental health. And there are people who are working. There, there, there is great stuff going on in the Lebanon, which people from all over the Arab world seem to go to to, to, to be more LGBT friendly. The, the, the people from, from Pakistan and Bangladesh trying to get across the border into India, because India is that little bit more LGBT friendly. Um, African countries are more difficult um, and, and more, more oppressive. Um, there's the Rainbow Railroad, which is in Canada, that's getting people out of really hostile countries. Um, sometimes you just end up feeling really powerless, because other than saying we're here to listen and you can tell us what you want to say, um, there is really very little more we can do. I think those countries, the work that Ilga's doing, we mentioned Nigel Warner earlier, he's one of our great unsung heroes. He's done amazing work with the International Lesbian and Gay Association, which Lisa was the first Secretary General of. Yeah, lesbian you, goes Secretary you, General. You, you, you? There were fellas before me. Well, well anyway, <laughs> um, you, 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 you were Secretary General of, yeah. and it's now an LGBT organisation, although the Ilga acronym survives. Um, there are people doing the work, and all we can do um, is support them. And there are funds around the world, particularly in America, that are putting money, which is, is often what makes a difference, into supporting people in countries where there is huge degrees of oppression. So very quietly, there, there are people being funded to do stuff. But it's very difficult when you could potentially be killed for being... For being you know, a gay man who has sex or, or, or a lesbian woman who, who is visible. 